honored guests, members of the graduating class, and ladies and gentlemen. I consider that I have an obligation to bring you up to date on a most important change in the world of humor. The joke about the racist and anti-feminist who obtained a personal interview with God and was disconcerted by what he saw has now been modified. It now relates to a citizen of the 13th Congressional District of Brooklyn who went to Washington to consult his representative in Congress. In amazement, he exclaimed to a friend on his return, she is black. Her name, in fact, is Shirley Chisholm. But she herself has declared, I don't want to be known as a Negro legislator. I am an American legislator. I am the people's politician. Although from birth she has been keenly aware of the growing problems of ghettos, she knows and works to alleviate the problems of all sections of all cities, the problems of all Americans. Born in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, a ghetto as well known as Harlem, the very versatile Shirley Chisholm brings to our country's legislative branch a background of tested leadership experience and she has always been at home on public platforms. With characteristic candor, she says of herself, I have a way of talking that does something to people. One thing the people in Washington and New York are afraid of in Shirley Chisholm is her mouth. After graduation from girls high school in Brooklyn, she went on to obtain a BA degree cum laude from Brooklyn College. She was later named that college's alumna of the year. She earned both an MA degree in education and a diploma in administration and supervision in the field of education at Columbia University. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me the greatest happiness to present to you the first black congressman, congresswoman, in the history of the United States, the Honorable Shirley Chisholm. Thank you very much. Faculty members, parents, and graduates, I am very glad to be here this afternoon. And I search my heart deeply in order to ascertain what would be the best message that I could bring to this group this afternoon. And I think that in light of what has been happening on our campuses across this land, I thought that I would like to talk about the university as a catalyst for change. And today our nation continues to enjoy many of the benefits of peace, but it is forced to adopt so much of the urgency and pressure of wartime. Institutions all over this country are being deeply affected by the winds of change that are sweeping across the land by the black revolution and the students' revolts. Will we have the courage and the commitment to succumb to the action required to stop utilizing our resources on warfare and work on the conservation and preservation of our most important resources, human beings? Will we cease and desist from practices that deprive blacks, Puerto Ricans, Indians, and other minorities from moving into the midstream of America to partake of the American dream? Will we be strong enough to transform our institutions to be relevant and meaningful for today's world? Today's graduates, for the most part, they are a generation of students who have introduced activism into our way of life. Today's graduates, Peaked by adult indifference in our society are more outspoken, 
are more independent and are more sophisticated. Today's graduates, in many instances, reflect our nation's hypocrisy that has been indulged in by many of our leaders in the private and public sector whose attitudes in and out of government leave far too much to be desired. It is a period of rebellion against traditional concepts and rigid institutions, and the struggles on our campuses and our colleges are oftentimes bitter and explosive. But we do need action as well as polemics. We need involvement in place of intellectualizing. And universities must become reconciled to the fact that whole chunks of their traditional way of thinking have to be revised. A dying people tolerates the present. A dying people rejects the future and finds its satisfaction in past greatness and half-remembered glory. Young Americans are rebellious. Young Americans are angry. Young Americans are searching. And the energy pours out in rumbles, in strikes, in causes, and sometimes even in crime. But it is energy. Wasted energy is only a small problem compared with the lack of it. You, the graduates, must employ your energy as you leave this campus to fight the battles against the injustices of the broader society. You must fight against racism and racial injustice at home, and against aggression and nuclear confrontation in America's actions at home and abroad. Graduates, it will require great moral courage to leave here this afternoon and assert that you no longer wish to be complacent regarding the evils and the injustices that surround you as individuals in your environment. And this ceremony this afternoon must be viewed as a time of commitment, a time of courage, a time of concern, and a time of compassion for your fellow men. It is your obligation to fight for the equality of man, for the demise of the evil of racism should not be made dependent on the good behavior of a race that has for so long been abused. There must exist that willingness to innovate and to pioneer. And we cannot cling to a false tranquility in a time of jarring upheavals for change affects man and the society he builds. And it behooves us who are charged with caring for those who cannot care for themselves educationally to observe change slowly and closely, to know how communities are altering their shape. And institutions all over America today must end their deceit and plan today so that those who come tomorrow will not be placed in the position of prolonging deceptions about the character of our nation. We must not permit our minds to be like concrete, all mixed up and firmly set. Our education has been a failure. If no matter how learned we are, it has failed to open our hearts. It seems to me that despite studies and charts and conferences, a most important element is needed to breathe new life in our universities and our cities. And that is a new breed of man and a new breed of woman on the American scene who is dedicated to innovative change. A breath of fresh air is sorely needed. Graduates, Despite our academic gowns and our academic caps, we can be just as transparent as the emperor in his new clothes. If an end of liberal education is, as Dewey said, that of expanding the range and the accuracy 
of one's perception of meaning, then who is there that our colleges cannot serve? Less well understood is the increasing student demand for educational relevance, a fundamental recognition of the need for social justice, and a commitment by the universities to address themselves to it. And unless our universities can meet this demand, especially in cities where social injustice is manifest, they will face increasing disruptions in the 1970s. Universities must today have a commitment to inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness, a commitment to equality rather than hierarchy. Reorientation is slow, but it is happening. A truly relevant education would enable students to discover injustice and human waste in the cities, schools, police, and court systems. The goal of the diversity in academic university programs to be meaningful for the future must be to produce a student who is not only at home in a professional discipline, but in touch with himself and the currents of his time. And universities cannot continue with business as usual on a quiet campus, nor can they continue on a campus that is paralyzed by student demonstrations. That is the challenge that confronts us today. As one alumnus in Tennessee said, quote, they keep asking me to give money to a place I no longer recognize, end quote. Of course, change is here. We are in the perplexing period of change. And the lashings out on our campuses today are only symptomatic of the grievous ills and decadent values in America where leaders are constantly saying to the young and to the disenchanted, do as I say, but not as I do. As Clark Kerr has aptly said, quote, the university today in America has now become a prime interest of national purpose. This is a new concept. This is the essence of the transformation now engulfing our campuses. And the desire for leadership academically that is attuned to the times has become the battle cry of the students. And large numbers of our students who have become defeated, disillusioned young people are so ripe for political agitators. And yet, many universities continue like the proverbial ostrich with their heads buried deeply in the sand. We can do little at home to create a good society as long as a vast proportion of public funds is allocated to defense and warfare. The students of this era and the activists have taught a great deal about how it is and how it ought to be. They have been, in a sense, society's faculty over the last few years. They have shown that a degree of change can arise from protest, but the hope for America, our nation, rests on a committed response. Graduates, you are about to play roles as mature citizens, and all that you do will not save America until all of us accept the belief in the brotherhood of man under the eyes of God. I wish good luck to all of us in setting out in the directions needed for change well before we are forced to change. In conclusion, my letter addressed only to the graduates. Dear graduates, you will find it difficult as you have found it to tolerate what you think of as the apathy and the backwardness of some of your older folks, but try to understand and learn from them what they still have to teach as you continue your own independent growth. You know that you must continue to fight the system that has been denying you the opportunity to be either a total man or a total woman. 
but fight intelligently. Fight so that you get results and achieve something. You can't tear down everything and build everything new at once. Be practical. You can learn this from the men and the women who have in their own best consciences fought the same fight before you as they can learn many things from you. You will have to guard against becoming like some of the older folks that you criticize when you get out into the community. They have been absorbed by the society as it is, and they have adjusted to things as they are, until many of them could not really think of changing. Now that you are graduating, don't cop out. Don't let yourselves be, in the current jargon, be co-opted. Remember, too, that you are not the end. It will not be long before you two are an older generation. You must be conscious of your crucial importance as models and images for younger people in this nation. Our task at this moment in history is a great one. And if we are to perform it, we must first understand what it is. We must neither withdraw from our society and our nation, nor must we be completely absorbed by it. We must, for our own sakes and for everyone's sake, find a better way to adopt what two sociologists, Christopher Jenks and David Riesman, concluded on the problem, quote, we must find forms of education that will help black people to cope with the white world without becoming either completely alienated from it or subservient to it. And we must, in a larger context, build new institutions or reform our old ones so that there are avenues of upward mobility and achievement that will allow black citizens to maintain creative tension between themselves and the white world. If we fail, this nation will be poorer for it. If we succeed, this nation will be richer indeed. God bless you. Go out, make your commitment, and remember one thing, when everything seems difficult and rough and you become disillusioned, Take a few words from one who has gone through all kinds of battles for the past 45 years. Look only to God and to your conscience for approval to help make America what it really can be. God bless you. <laughs>